so it's great to be here with you, especially given that introduction of how people think about Harvard Business School. But I've been teaching at Harvard Business School for a long time, and I've had the great privilege over the last 10 years in teaching a program for new CEOs. These are people who've been just appointed CEOs of large companies, uh, typically a billion dollars or more. Uh, we get them to the school in groups of 10, and at the end of the first day, we ask them to do something that terrifies them. We ask them to rate on a list of 10, a list of 10 items where we say, tell us what you feel most prepared to do, and tell us what you feel least prepared to do. And these include things like setting the strategy for the company, organizing change, getting a new management team, working with my boards of directors. But one of the items is setting the right moral tone and creating the appropriate values and ethics for my organization. What is striking to me is that in this forced order ranking that we ask them to do, where you have to say 10 is, this is the hardest thing that I know I will have to do, to one being the easiest thing that I will have to do, Inevitably, people rank setting the right moral values and ethics of their company as number one or number two. They think this is easy because they all feel deeply secure in their own moral compass. They have a sense that they're people of extraordinary moral character and that it's very unlikely that they're gonna do anything in their organization to lead either the organization astray or do something that will get them in the front pages of the newspapers. What's remarkable, though, is how often we, in fact, encounter these very CEOs and leaders on the front pages of newspapers, having done precisely the thing that they thought that they would never do. Uh, whether it's Bernie Madoff uh, or Elliot Spitzer, you can look at any walk of life and you find leaders who have acted in ways that shock us. Uh, in fact, uh, I would argue that they have acted in ways that sometimes would shock them. Yet when we encounter people like this, our immediate instinct is to say, that was a rotten apple. We should have seen that coming a long time ago. Uh, this must have been something that was deeply about their character that somehow or the other, they didn't reveal to others. Uh, and we distance ourselves from them and continue to feel confident that that would never happen to me. That's not gonna be something that I would ever do. And so we live in this moral confidence uh, that this could not happen to us, that this only happens to bad people. We tend to characterize the world as people who are good and bad, and we are always good. I call this habit that we each have moral overconfidence. We are each morally overconfident. Now, we all understand intellectual overconfidence, right? So if I said that the average IQ in this room is 120, and I asked for a quick show of hands, how many people think their IQ is about 120? Right, I mean, there's one person who's just being bold here, but typically in a room like this, 80% of the people would raise their hand and say, you know, of course, I'm the one who's above 120. The rest of the other people might be below that, right? So we, we've deeply understood intellectual overconfidence for a long time, but we haven't really understood moral overconfidence, which is an equally pervasive tendency that we have as human beings. We all like to think of ourselves as being good and better than the average person. Uh, to show people how pervasive and powerful that this can be, that morality is not something that is a deep character trait that you have that is immutable and un unchangeable. That each of us is capable of behaving in ways uh, that would shock us, let alone shock other people. Uh, we have at Harvard Business School for many years been teaching a course called Leadership and Corporate Accountability. And one of the things that we do in that course is to show people this one very famous experiment. Uh, some of you might know about it. It's called the Milgram Experiment, which was done uh, by Stanley Milgram at Yale in the 1960s. I'm gonna show you sh short clips of this video to just give you a sense of what it is. So why don't we see a first clip that gives you the setup of how the experiment was set up. It is May 1962. An experiment is being conducted in the Elegant Interaction Laboratory at Yale University. The subjects are 40 males between the ages of 20 and 50 residing in the greater New Haven area. They were obtained by a newspaper advertisement and direct mail solicitation. The subjects range in occupation from corporation presidents to good humor men and plumbers, and in educational level from one who had not finished elementary school to subjects who have doctorate and other professional degrees. So notice these were people who were Regular people, they could be anybody in this room. We could have picked any 40 people from this room, except that they'd have to be the men. Uh, this was the 1960s. 
And that's the group that we chose. This was not a group that was chosen to be either morally courageous or morally indolent. These were just regular people. They included presidents of companies. They included people in power, and they included people who didn't have power. So when they come to this experiment, uh, they each match with someone who is going to, they're going to be a teacher, and they're matched with someone who is going to be a learner. Uh, and as teacher, they have to conduct a word exercise in which the learner has to learn a set of words. And if the learner gets the words wrong, uh, you're supposed to administer an electric shock uh, to the learner. Uh, how many of you have been shocked just by 110 words? You know, the stuff that we have going on? Does it hurt? OK, so it, it, it hurts, right? So even 110 words hurts. So the level at which they started the thing was 45 words. But you'll see that there was this machine. Right? So you're supposed to press the lever. Each time the learner makes a mistake, you're supposed to give them a shock, starting at 45 words. And notice the words as they go along. Very strong shock. Intense shock at 255. 315. Extreme. Danger. And then the kind of ultimate magic, XXX, right? Now, it doesn't take a rocket science this to know that if you're delivering XXX to someone else, that's a problem. Right? That doesn't take a rocket scientist. And uh, in the beginning of the experiment, the teachers, uh, which ended up being all of the subjects, there was a little game in which uh, each person got a chit, and they thought that they randomly drew who was going to be teacher and learner. But of course, there was a slight trick. Both things said the same thing. So of course, the subjects always drew the teacher category, and the other person became the learner. No real shocks were delivered to the learner, I promise you, uh, because it was a confederate. Uh, but the teacher didn't know. The teacher really thought that the shock was being delivered. Uh, and what you'll see is now the introduction of how the teacher was introduced to the learner. Now, if you get it correct, fine. If you make an error, however, you'll be punished with an electric shock. So, of course, it is to your advantage that you learn all these word pairs as quickly as possible. I think so. Uh, do you have any questions now before we go into the next room? Uh, no, but I think I should say this. Uh, about two years ago, I was at the Veterans Hospital in West Haven. Mm -hmm. And while there, they detected a heart condition. Nothing serious. But as long as I'm having these shocks, uh, how strong are they? How dangerous are they? Well, no, although they may be painful, they're not dangerous. Mm -hmm. Anything else? No, that's all. <laughs> so after this, you know, the... There's a series of words that the learner communicates via microphone. The, uh, the teacher communicates. The learner is sent to another room. And each time uh, the learner makes a mistake, which is all being done by cue, uh, there's nothing different that is going to be presented to any of the people who are going to be the teachers. Uh, the teacher has to give them an electric shock. And it starts off, innocently enough, at uh, 45 volts. But somewhere in the middle, uh, it becomes quite intense, and you begin to s hear the person who is in the learner condition say the following sets of things. Sh sharp, axe, needle, stick, blade. Ask, please. Wrong. I'm up to 180 volts. Please continue, teacher. Neil, you're gonna get a shot. 180 volts. Oh. I can't stand the pain. Let me out of here. I'm not gonna kill that man. Do you hear him hollering? He's they said before the shocks may be painful, but yeah, they're not dangerous. Either. They're hollering. He can't stand it. What if something happens to him? The experiment requires that you continue, teacher. Yeah, but uh, <laughs> I'm not gonna get that man sick in there. I mean, he's hollering in there. You know what I mean? I mean, <laughs> well, whether the learner likes it or not, we must go on until well, he's learned I mean, all the uh, word pairs. I refuse to take the responsibility. I'm getting hurt in there. You know, I'm not. I mean, he's under hollering. So, you know, despite the protests, uh, he administers the shot because the experimenter, who's in this position of authority, tells him to continue, and it goes on. Uh, and now we'll see what happens next, which is after the person protests in the room, the next act is he bangs wildly at the door, saying, let me out, let me out. The so shocks still continue because the experimenter says, keep going. Then you hear no noise continue, from the learner. Uh, green, grass, hat, ink, apple. 
An answer, please. Go on with the procedure, please, teacher. 315 volts, the answer is ink. And it continues. Nice one. Gold, dollar, necklace, moon, paint. Something's happened to that man in there. You better check in on him, sir. He won't answer me or nothing. Please uh, continue. Go on, please. You accept all the responsibility? The responsibility is mine. Correct. Please go on. Gold, dollar, necklace, moon, paint. Answer, please. Are you all right? 405 volts. The answer is moon. This is at 405 volts. We're already at the XXX point, and there's three more to go. And he goes all the way till the very end. Now, here's a question. Uh, how many of you believe that if you were in the shoes of the person who was the teacher, that you would have stopped? All right, so two-thirds of the room raised their hand, and they said, you know, I, I would stop. What fraction do you think actually went all the way? So two-thirds of the people went all the way. Right? So now let me ask you the next question that I ask my students when we teach this class. Having told you that two-thirds of the students went all the way who were in that condition, how many of you believe you would have been in the one-third? <laughs> right? And yet what you see in the class is two-thirds of the people raise their hand. This is moral overconfidence. Right? This is moral overconfidence. This is our deep-seated belief that somehow or the other we are better than the other person, that our own moral compass will not fail us. And yet, the truth of the matter is that it routinely does, that you and I are as fallible as anybody else. And there can be circumstances in which our best moral selves will fail us. And we know what those conditions are. So here is a condition in which people fail because they succumb to authority. Someone who seems very legitimate, a professor at Yale who's conducting an experiment, seems to be taking responsibility for everything that I need to do. At some point, you just stop taking personal responsibility. Even though you're the person who's pressing the lever, you feel that the responsibility has been taken by someone else. So when you give away your power to someone else, you can sometimes act in ways that belie your own moral compass. But the other thing is equally true. When you have power, that's an equally dangerous moment. In fact, Abraham Lincoln, who was a great student of character, once said that when people think about how to judge a person's character, they say, let's confront them with adversity. Let's put them in difficult circumstances. He said, in my experience, actually, many people rise to that challenge. People seem to do quite well when confronted with adversity. He says, the real test of a person's character is to give them power. And in my experience, all too many people disappoint us in terms of living up to their character when they have power. And you know, he did it just by folks upon intuition. But there was another experimenter, uh, Zimbardo, who ran a set of experiments at Stanford a little bit after this, who proved to us the other point. What he did is he created a prison in the basement of Stanford. Uh, and he had people join the prison experiment uh, purely by putting out an ad just like this. Right? So these are not people who said, you know, I want to be in this experiment because I believe in torture. Uh, half of them were randomly assigned to the position of prisoners. And half of them were randomly assigned to the position of the guards of the prison. Within 24 hours, the guards of the prison were behaving in more abusive ways towards these prisoners than you could imagine any prison guard in the worst prison that you could think of. So once they had the power over these other people, they simply acted in ways that were abhorrent. So it's quite striking how being put in a position of power can very easily cause people to lose their moral compass. And we have leaders in business, in government, in all walks of life 
who end up with extraordinary power. Uh, they live in circumstances in which people tell them that they can do no wrong. Uh, they have the extraordinary power to change people's lives. Uh, they very rarely are checked. So we shouldn't be that surprised that every now and then, one of them begins to act in a way where they lose their moral compass. So what can we do? What can we do about this problem of moral overconfidence, which I think is at the root of many of the problems that we see when leaders fail us? I think early on, early on in people's lives, we have to, one, disabuse them of the notion that character is something that is like a trait. It's inborn in me. I can't tell you the number of times I have to tell our alumni who, when they encounter one of our alumni having done something bad, just remind me, if you had only done the admissions test better, as if there's some meter that I could put the finger through of every student, and if it came clean, they would never, ever engage in wrongdoing over the rest of their life. The reality is that even if everybody passed clean, they may still be susceptible to doing something later on because they haven't yet tasted power. It's when they taste power that we will discover what their real character is or whether they will be, in fact, true to the thing that they believe is important to them. So the first thing that we have to do is we have to realize this is that character is as malleable as anything else, that we have to cultivate and nurture it over the course of our lives as we cultivate wisdom or intelligence or anything else. That's the first thing that we have to do. The second thing that we have to do is to make sure that people have moral humility. I think we need leaders with greater moral humility who know that they are fallible and therefore steel themselves and have antenna to recognize that there are times when I can go astray. If they do that, then I think we are much more likely to be protected rather than them just feeling overconfident about their own moral compass. In a bizarre way, I actually think that confidence, which is with something that we prize so much in leaders, is actually something that we should be afraid of when it comes to morality. We, in fact, should admire humility in people who know that I could go wrong, because those are the people that I think are much more likely to, in fact, be the person who says, I want to stop. So I want to leave you with a very simple thing for you to take away from this thing. Remember, this is not just about leaders. You, many of you are leaders in this room, too. Uh, how would you cultivate your moral humility? The next time you read about someone who's done something that you say, how could they do it? Ask yourself, could I have done it? And what might be the conditions in which I would be capable of doing exactly the thing that I believe I would never do? That's the first step to cultivating moral humility. Thank you.